Thank you all for joining us for today's Badger Dairy Insight Meeting. My name is Heather Slusser, Agriculture Extension Educator in Marathon County, and I'm your moderator for the day. Today, we have several speakers that are going to speak with us about the main topic of managing our heifers maturity pre and post breeding. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please place them in the chat box below. Our final speaker for the day is Dr. Matt Aikens. Dr. Matt Aikens is an assistant scientist and dairy extension specialist with a focus on dairy heifer nutrition and management. As part of his role, he works with the Marshfield Agriculture Research Station to conduct heifer research studies to evaluate nutrition and conventional and alternative forage feeding strategies to control heifer growth and cost of production. His current work involves working with dairy and beef producers to evaluate dairy beef calf management and calf growth and yield and quality of alternative forages for heifers and lactating cows. I will turn it over to you now, Matt. Yeah, thanks, Heather. I appreciate the introduction. Really enjoyed the uh, previous uh, presentations on uh, reproduction and also on scales. Uh, I think there's a, a very large opportunity out there for dairy producers and, and with beef producers to implement the use of scales. Um, just in the, the last year when, when our project to evaluate on-farm growth of dairy beef crosses, we, we found that it's been hard to find producers that have been using scales. And so it's very difficult to manage heifers and, and cattle for growth if we can't measure them. So it's a really big opportunity, I think. Uh, I think scales are fairly affordable if you compare them to other pieces of equipment that we purchase. Um, so I think that's something that we need to be looking at pretty seriously, uh, especially for uh, dairy heifer and, and also beef cattle production. So, so in this presentation, I'm going to be focusing on the use of high fiber forages uh, as a way to control heifer intake and growth, especially in, in pregnant heifers. Uh, much of this presentation will focus post breeding, uh, mainly due to the, the use of the high fiber, fiber forages would probably not be a place to be using for say uh, um, pre-breeding uh, dairy heifers. So a kind of overview of the heifer management goals. Uh, Tina did a nice job earlier, but just again, we wanna be striving to calve between about 22 to 24 months, uh, really maximizes the productivity uh, once they be uh, come uh, lactating cows. Um, it also helps reduce feed cost. If we're if we have a higher uh, calving age, we can try to reduce that to within that range and, and try to cut our feeding costs. And also, obviously, we'd we gain some productive days as well. Um, we also want to look at controlling costs as uh, either through uh, different feeding strategies or through uh, controlling the number of uh, heifers in the uh, heifer inventory, as Tina already mentioned. We also want to look at trying to control our nutrient excretion. Uh, two main nutrients we want to be looking at are phosphorus and uh, nitrogen. So we want to be monitoring the phosphorus content of the diets and also our protein in our diet. So we don't want to be overfeeding those nutrients because that's going to be detrimental to the environment. And we want to allow the genetic potential of the animals to really show through, especially when, once they become lactating. So we don't want to do anything during the heifer rearing uh, phase that could potentially be detrimental. So we want to really allow um, adequate growth throughout the entire phase uh, of heifer rearing. So we don't want to be, we want to try to uh, really increase growth, especially uh, pre-weaning, and then really optimize growth from there on. So we're going to be hitting our targets for uh, for our body weights, as uh, Tina and Erica mentioned. So we we obviously need optimal growth rates throughout the entire rearing phases to really to hit the right pre-breeding uh, targets at 55% at breeding. So we really need to 
get an idea of what do we, what's our average daily gain that we need from weaning to breeding? So we need to do some math to figure out what's our body weights at each of those starting and our, our goals at, at breeding. It's really fairly simple uh, to, to do. Just gotta actually go out there and start measuring animals. Um, but if we have a starting point and a goal, we can then figure out what our, our targets would be for average daily gain uh, to be able to breed by that 13 month of age. And then our early goal from breeding to calving once the animals are uh, have conceived is really to control their energy intake to avoid over conditioning. Um, this over conditioning can be, a, can be a major issue, especially for dairy heifers. Um, their intakes are increasing uh, fairly uh, substantially uh, after um, breeding. And so if you're feeding a fairly high energy diet, especially uh, with corn silage, that can very quickly cause uh, heifers to gain excess fat. So there's a nice uh, tool that you can use to estimate um, a uh, target body weights based upon the mature body weight of your herd. So as Megan and Tina and Erica mentioned, you wanna be measuring mature cows in the herd um, to get this value. Um, so we've measured cows in the UW herd and typical range of mature body weights are between 1600 uh, to 1700, but there has been cows that are obviously much heavier than that upwards of 1,800 to 2,000 pounds. Um, so there's quite a bit of variability and that's something to consider as well in this mature body weight. But we wanna, we wanna get an idea of what the, the average is uh, so we can then build our heifer management program based upon that. So in this spreadsheet, you would enter in the mature body weight from your herd and then you would then have an output of those target body weights that you can use. As you can see in this, at that 13 month of age, our target's gonna be about 875 to uh, 900 pounds at 13 months would be our target. At 12 months of age, which I, I highly suggest getting a body weight, how about that year, aid, year of, of age mark uh, to then have an idea, do we need to wait a little bit to really target to, to breed those animals, are they not heavy enough um, to breed if say they're under 825 at a year of age, do we need to wait a few weeks after uh, 13 months of age to then start breeding so they can attain that uh, proper body size before calving. So that's what we do at, uh, in the UW is we will take a wait about 12 months of age, make a decision on whether or not they're adequate size and then um, decide on whether they should be bred at 13 months or not. So post-breeding, um, so obviously our calving is, we want to calve them in at about 22 to 24 months. So if with an animal at 1,650 of uh, mature body weight, uh, they're going to be at breeding, they should be about 875, as I mentioned before. At calving, the target body weight would be about 1525 uh, pounds. That's about 92, 93% of mature body weight. So the total gain needed is gonna be about 650 pounds uh, from 13 months of age up to 22 to 23 months. So, and in that, if they have 305 days, about 10 months to, to gain that, um, that's gonna be about two to 2.2 pounds per day is our target. Um, it's a bit higher than what our previous targets have been in that 1.8 pounds per day. Um, so you really gotta look at that mature body weight it makes a big impact on this. If you have that, if you have a smaller mature body weight of say 1400 to 1500 pounds, then your daily gains are gonna be drastically, uh, will be less. So it'd be in, probably in that 1.8 to two pounds per day. But if you have a higher mature body weight herd, then you're gonna have to adjust your um, nutrition a bit to get that 
to attain those higher daily gains required to, to hit those benchmarks for heifer growth. So the nutritional needs, um, this is a, a nice table that Pat Hoff and they put together, um, just showing the dry matter intake. As you go from a 300 pound heifer up to 1200 pounds, increases fairly substantially. Um, at that 1200 pound uh, body weight mark, they're gonna be eating 25 to 30 pounds of, of feed per day, uh, so fairly substantial. And that's where we can get into trouble is with those larger heifers, if we have too high of energy, they're gonna be putting on a, a large amount of fat, which uh, we don't wanna be doing that, especially prior to calving. Protein, as you can see, as they, their intakes go up, their protein goes, uh, needs uh, generally go down, uh, going from 17% uh, for those younger heifers down to about 13 to 14% for those uh, post-breeding heifers. And as looking at energy, um, total digestible nutrients also decrease uh, as, as those heifers become larger and have higher intakes. Um, typically in post-breeding diets, we're going to be shooting for about 60 to 62% TDN in our diets or about 1.1 megacals of metabolizable energy per pound of dry matter. Now, the, there has been some updates um, last year to these requirements. Um, I looked at those earlier and those protein and energy requirements were fairly similar, uh, comparable to the 2001 requirements for, for dairy heifers. One thing that I did notice was that the, especially those late gestation heifers, they've increased the energy slightly. And I think that's to accommodate uh, greater um, calf growth, greater fetal growth. Um, so they, really want to control, especially up through that, up to about that third trimester, but we do want to be considerate about, about that fetal growth. So we don't want to be restricting um, energy intake too much uh, past uh, about two to three months before calving. So as I mentioned before, this is our kind of our target that, that we have for when we use these high fiber forage diets, about 60 to 62% TDN, 1.1 megacal of ME, and about 13 to 14% protein is gonna hit our targets um, for both um, energy and protein. What can be a problem is, again, as I mentioned before, is corn silage is very difficult to bring the energy down in that. <laughs> Uh, if we get anything over about 25% of the diet as corn silage, we can really start to see uh, some problems with um, over, um, over conditioning. So what we'd like to do is use a, a higher fiber forage um, as a way to dilute the energy and to really control intake, um, or we can use limit feeding. So it really depends on what your management is. Um, when you're using a a higher fiber forage, uh, you can really allow for ad libitum intakes. You're not gonna, the management side of it's uh, a bit less of a hassle. Compared to a limit feeding program, you really gotta be on top of your game as far as watching dry matters of the forages and the feeds, really watching feed bunks and adjusting those diets as those uh, animals grow. So limit feeding is, uh, it does take quite a bit of management skill to be able to implement that. So the reason we can use these higher, higher fiber forage, forages to restrict intake is because heifers will eat, they're limited in how much fiber they can eat. They only can eat about 1% of their body weight as NDF per day. And that's very consistent across different body weights, as you can see from the figure. Going from a 300 pound heifer all the way up to a 15, 100 pound heifer, they're pretty consistent of in the amount or the percent of body weight and fiber that they can eat per day. So we can use that as a way to, to really control intake by feeding higher fiber diets. Uh, so in, in this example, we have a thousand pound heifer. We're gonna estimate she's gonna eat about 10 pounds of NDF per day. If we feed a 45% NDF diet, uh, 
they, the heifer would eat about 22 pounds of dry matter. If we feed a slightly higher NDF diet, we can kind of, we can get that intake down by a couple pounds down to 20 pounds. So I can save quite a bit of, of nutrients going into that animal and really control the intake. And there's several percent, potential options available to uh, use as a dilutant or high fiber forage. Uh, we've done some work with uh, forage sorghums, with straw, uh, corn stover, uh, low quality hay, and then gamma grass. Uh, there's also some low, low starch corn silage that I think I've seen producers um, in Wisconsin starting to use where they have a, a very long day corn silage, say 130, 140 day corn silage hybrid. We know that it's not going to um, completely mature to where it's going to get grain. They then pair that with a very short day in 85 to 90 day corn silage that they know will become fairly dry. And then they can chop that um, and get a, a fairly low starch corn silage that fits fairly well in, in heifer diets. Um, so we're going to go through a few of the feeding trials that we've done with the forage sorghums and the, and the gamma grass and the straw and stover, just an example of potential use of these in heifer diets. So in our first study that we did, um, this is looking at use of sorghum sedan grass. Uh, and these are uh, post-bred heifers. These are between uh, 16 to 18 months of age when they started the trial. Uh, and what we did was we had a, a control diet, so about half haylage, uh, about 20% corn silage, and about a quarter of it was uh, a fairly low quality uh, chopped grass hay. And then we had two different sorghum sedan grass uh, silage diets. So they both contained about half uh, the diet as sorghum sedan. And most of it was from the, and then the rest was mostly from haylage and a small bit of corn silage just to balance the energy content. Uh, the only difference between these sorghum sedan was the, uh, the type of sorghum sedan. One was a conventional type and one was a photo period sensitive type. But really the quality of the two were very similar as far as fiber and, and energy. And what happened to the diets was the NDF content. Uh, we, when we added the sorghum sedan grass, uh, increased substantially up to about 55%. Uh, protein uh, was slightly lower on the sorghum sedan, about 13%. But as you can, as I'll show you on the growth data, really did not. We're not. We're not a, thinking that that affected growth uh, by any means. So that's within the recommendations um, or requirements. And the actually the energy was fairly similar, at about 60 percent TDN across the three diets. So when we look at the performance data of the heifers, as I mentioned, intake is going to be affected by NDF content. So you can see this control diet, those, those heifers were eating about 24 pounds of dry matter compared to these heifers on the sorghum sedan di grass diets for about 20 pounds of dry matter. So we reduced the intakes by four pounds per day. The NDF, con NDF intakes were actually exactly the same across all three diets at about 11 pounds per day. Uh, and then the NDF as a percent of body weight, as I mentioned, really close to that 1% of body weight. So you can see how tightly regulated the intake of NDF is. So the rumen fill was attained on these diets. So they couldn't really eat anymore because their, their digestive system was filled with, uh, with fiber. Now, if you look at the daily gain, this is really what, where these high fiber forages can help. Even when we did use a fairly low quality grass hay, they were still gaining almost two and a half pounds per day, which is drastically above what our goals are. We want to be in that, remember, two to 2.1 pounds per day. Using the sorghum stand grass, we really were able to hit those targets right about two to 2.1 pounds. So, as you can see, it, it those higher fiber forages help to control the intake uh, and all of energy uh, without really uh, with, and then help to control the body weight gain on these heifers so they're not gaining excess condition. 
The other thing that this did was it actually helped to control the, the cost per day because we're feeding four pounds less uh, dry matter. So we saved about 20 cents per heifer per day by, by using these higher fiber forages. Next, we'll go through some gamma grass data. It's actually a, a warm season perennial. Uh, Wayne Koblenz, a, a previous uh, research scientist with USDA uh, located in Marshfield, uh, did several years of, of plot and feeding studies with uh, Eastern gamma grass. And the way he managed it was he would, um, it would ma mainly was looking at a way to do a single harvest of gamma grass in the late summer to early fall timeframe. And what you can see on this is the accumulation of dry matter uh, per acre. So it starts off fairly small in June and then by July, late July, early August, it really starts to, to maximize the, the yield of forage up towards to about 5,000 to 7,000 pounds of dry matter. Uh, per acre. So about, I figure about two to three, maybe three and a half tons of dry matter uh, yield from Eastern gamma grass is probably typical with a one season or one cut system in late summer. But what's really kind of unique about this forage is it's very high in fiber uh, and the cattle actually love to eat this stuff. The quality of it is very high because it's mostly all leaves. Um, so the cattle will not generally sort this type of uh, forage. They actually like to eat it because it's very soft uh, and palatable. But you can see it in that late seasons, the NDF content generally ranges about 75 to 80%. So as a high fiber forage, it can really help to dilute the energy and increase the fiber in these, in these heifer diets. The other thing that these could be really useful is for feeding for dry cows because it has the higher fiber for it, the higher fiber content, and also the potassium contents fairly low compared to say alfalfa silage or even other grass silages. So that's another opportunity for these warm season perennials is as, is as a, a dry cow feed. It's in place of maybe straw if we're using that in, in dry cow diets. So in this trial, uh, Wayne uh, decided to compare three different types of dilutant forages. So we looked at gamma grass, which is EGG, uh, to wheat straw, which is fairly commonly used, and then corn fodder. So you can see the control diet, very high in corn silage deliberately do he did that to cause a negative effect or really high gains. Um, so over half of the diet was corn silage in the control compared to the dilutant diets were about 25 to 30%. And then the haylage was about 50% in the dilutant diets. And then the other, uh, the dilutant forages were between 15 to 25% of the, of the diet. And he was really targeting that 50% NDF uh, content of the diet and 13 to 14% protein, and then right around 59 to 60% TDN were his, were his goals. So, fairly similar to the Sorghum Sudan grass study we did previously. One thing to consider with these high fiber forages or roughages is sorting. It can be a, can be a problem, especially if we get we don't chop that forage appropriately or pre-process, uh, say the straw or fodder before we add it to the TMR. So you can see the control bars are in blue. The higher the bars, the more sorting the animals were doing. The blue bars, the control diet, they were very minimal sorting. Also the red bars, the that's the gamma grass, very little sorting, so they, they like to eat that, that soft palatable uh, silage. The straw had fairly minimal sorting. Uh, they did pre-process that through a uh, chopper, uh, or a, a, a vertical uh, chopper. So it had some increase in um, 
the fiber content of the TMR over time, but fairly minimal compared to the corn fodder where it had a significant increase. So you could see those animals were sorting that. So that corn fodder probably needs to be ground a bit finer if we're gonna decide to add that to the diet so they aren't able to, to sort that. If we look at the intake and the performance of these animals, uh, the dry matter intake, uh, right around 24 pounds for the control. As we uh, added these dilutant forages, we were able to reduce the intakes by about uh, one to three pounds, depending on the, the dilutant forage we added. The NDF content was, or intakes were actually fairly similar, similar to the last uh, study, right around 11 pounds. But when we look at the NDF as a percent of body weight, these control ones, we probably didn't have enough fiber in the diet to really uh, uh, cause a, uh, or the, the energy content was high enough in the diet. That was probably the limiting factor. They never really got to full room and fill. So their energy needs were being met by the, the diet instead of the fill causing the restriction on the feed intake. While the other diets, these, the gamma grass, the straw and the fodder, we're being controlled by rumen fill instead. When we look at the daily gains, uh, the control diet, again, two and a half pounds per day when we fed a, a fairly high corn silage diet compared to right at our targets, right around two uh, pounds of, of gain. This wheat straw diet, you can see that the intakes were a bit lower. Uh, maybe we need to consider with that diet um, probably backing off the straw a little bit. Maybe we were a little too aggressive with the amount of straw we put in the diet. Uh, so we need to make those adjustments. Um, and over time on a farm, again, that's where we, that's where scales come in is to make those adjustments so we can, we can modify the diet appropriately. So as far as management suggestions with these high fiber forages is you really got to work with your agronomist and nutritionist on, on what's going to work on your farm. Um, do you want to um, purchase, maybe purchase low quality uh, hay or silage uh, first and try it out before you actually start to grow your own? That's a possible option. Um, so you really got to work with them as far as figuring out what's going to work with your cropping situation. You want to consider your chop length. So you want to probably be uh, fairly, especially with these like sorghum sedan grass or um, other uh, forage sorghums, you want to probably be on the small side for chop length because uh, they can be, um, when we harvest them, as you can see on the bottom picture, we can get fairly long stems that don't chop very well, especially when we do a cut, wilt, and chop system that the way they come into the chopper, they don't come in like corn sabs. They're gonna come in all directions. So that cutter don't always get a good uh, uniform cut length. So we wanna probably reduce the chop length when we're harvesting a, a crop like sorghum sedan grass. We do wanna feed these for ad lib of intakes. Uh, we target about one to 3% refusals every day, but we don't wanna have excess. If we start to feed too much, what they're going to do is they're going to sort the higher fiber uh, forages out of the diet. So they're going to eat the, the better quality uh, feeds in the diet. Um, use of water might be able to help with this if the diet's especially dry. Um, so that's something to consider. And lastly, and probably the most important is you actually want to measure your heifer growth on, on the farm to make adjustments to the diets. Uh, so that's really important is you can't really measure uh, or make adjustments unless you know how the animals are performing. So just in summary, the use of uh, NDF is a really good strategy to control uh, ad lib and intakes on, on, for dairy heifers. And these are just some targets that we use right around 50, 55% uh, NDF, 60% uh, TDN and 1.1 megacals of ME per pound. And that works really well for our freestyle housed uh, heifers. Um, but that might be slightly different depending on the housing or whether 
uh, in your area. So if you're in, in a three-sided barn, as Erica mentioned, they might be exposed, more exposed to the, the elements. Uh, so you might need to maybe increase energy slightly in these diets to, to allow for some energy use for, for uh, warmth or for uh, body uh, temperature maintenance. So that's something to consider. Uh, and that's where those body weight measurements come in handy is to be able to de determine, really target what the diet energy needs are for the individual farm. So I, I thank you. I uh, just want to mention that this work was supported by a USDA uh, hatch project as well, which was very important to complete, especially the sorghum Sudan grass work. I guess if there's any questions, I can I can take those. Thank you, Matt. Uh, you do actually have two questions. The first question is, what is the ideal time to start feeding forage to calves pre-weaning? So pre-weaning? Yes, that's what the question states. Okay. So yeah, I don't, <laughs> I don't have a definite answer, but some of the more recent research that's coming out that has been published is showing that there, there is some advantage to using a very high quality uh, grass hay for, for dairy calves. Uh, the really important part is, has to be very good quality, uh, high sugar content, low fiber grass hay. Um, they, there's been some work done in Spain uh, looking at that. Um, they offered it, I think with, I'd have to look at the data again, but I, uh, I think within a week to two weeks, they started offering it. But you don't wanna offer too much is the thing. You don't wanna offer just, just, just hay. So we, I really stress to, that starter is the main source of nutrients. It should be, because those are gonna really develop the, the rumen papillae. But you can offer a small amount of hay uh, pre-weaning, but it has to be, it's really critical that it's high quality. Otherwise they're not gonna digest it. Wonderful. The other question that we have for you is what is the current status of on-farm digital image analysis technology that can estimate body condition score and body weight without the use of a scale? That's a very good question. <laughs> so I know there's work being done in Marshfield by uh, Dr. Joao uh, Dorea, where he's measured, taking images from dairy heifers and then uh, also body weights and building uh, a sy system and models to be able to do that. So right now it's in uh, the development phase of right. that. So I, I It'd be really great if we could be able to implement that on, on farms uh, to be able to uh, estimate body weight and condition based on, the, on those images. At this time, we have reached the conclusion of our presentation. Coming up on March 29th, Dr. Paul Fricke will be with us to speak about the randomness of reproduction. This will be our final Badger Dairy Insight, so make sure you are there, that you tune in from 1 p.m. to 2.30, because we know you don't want to miss it. It'll be a fabulous presentation. Thank you all for being here today.